Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, Mother Nature interfered today and uh, detoured Ron's airplane to Burlington, Vermont, rather than Manchester, so we're just very happy that he's here and just uh, 10, 15 minutes late. Uh, my name is Ken Yalowitz. I'm the director of the Dickey Center for International Understanding here at Dartmouth. And I'm very, very happy to welcome you to, uh, this is not one of our great issues lectures, but it's certainly a very important public event uh, sponsored by the Dickey Center. And that is a presentation by Ron Suskind entitled, Can Democracy Survive the War on Terror? I think it's very fitting, uh, Ron, that you're here today, because uh, we had a very good example yesterday, no matter if you were delighted with the outcome of the elections or unhappy, I think there were probably a few people, but... Um, <laughs> they didn't come. They didn't come. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm neutral, I and mean, you have to understand. I, I, I don't take positions, but no matter what, uh, no matter what, uh, the sight yesterday of our democracy functioning in a nicely held election was very reassuring. So, uh, as I say, Ron, I think it's just very fitting today that, uh, that you're here. I must say that we're, this is personally very pleasing to welcome uh, Ron, uh, really to welcome him back. Um, he has been a very frequent visitor to Dartmouth over the years. Uh, he spends his summers up here and he's been at the, uh, associated with the Rockefeller Center and more recently with the government department. And I must say uh, that many of us uh, in the government department and a variety of departments here at the Dickey Center and other places at Rocky uh, have benefited very, very much from both the formal and the informal conversations with Ron. And some of you may remember that we had a, uh, a very good panel here about one year ago on the future of, of the U.S. intelligence capability. Uh, Judge Larry Silberman and, and John McLaughlin, the former uh, deputy head of CIA, Ned LeBeau. And that event really uh, developed out of a conversation that, uh, that Ron and I had about the need to, to air some of these is issues. So I, as I say, I'm, it's really correct, uh, the very direct influence that he's had. Ron Suskind is a journalist and writer uh, based in Washington, D.C. From 1993 to 2000, uh, he was a senior national affairs reporter for the Wall Street Journal. And in 1995, he won the uh, very prestigious Pulitzer Prize for feature writing uh, for his work on any inner city honor students in the Washington, D.C. area. This work then became the basis for his 1998 publication, The Hope of the Unseen. He's also the author of The Price of Loyalty, uh, George W. Bush, The White House, and The Education of Paul O'Neill, published in 2004. And I'm sure you're familiar with his latest book uh, on the bestseller list, um, The One Percent Doctrine, Deep Inside America's Pursuit of Its Enemies Since 9-11. This, for those of you who've had a chance to read it, uh, is a very frank, incisive, and, and very uh, extraordinary portrait of the Bush administration's war on terror and motivation behind uh, its counterterrorism strategy. Ron currently writes for Time Magazine, The New York Times Magazine, Esquire Magazine, and as I already mentioned, uh, The Wall Street Journal. I just wanted to add one more word about Ron. He practices the kind of journalism for which the press was named the fourth estate. He asks the difficult questions, probes the inconvenient truths, and spurns deferential treatment of the powerful so as to be the veritable check on government that journalism should be in a democracy. It is perhaps fitting then that the topic of his presentation is democracy itself. And please join me in welcoming Ron Suskind. Cool. Okay. Well, thank you, Ken. Boy, that. 
you got to stop saying things like that about me. It's, uh, well, my, well, I'm still a disappointment to my mother. That's what I keep hearing in my head. That's good, I think. She wanted better, law schools, anything, a professional. Actually, it was interesting. After I won the Pulitzer, there was a dinner at Dow Jones. I was working for the Wall Street Journal in those days. And they fly up your family. And my mother was flown up from Florida. She lives in Boca Raton. She was in something called the Polo Club in Boca, which is named after a long line of, of great Jewish polo players. And, um, <laughs> And so she flies up, and you know, one on one, she could negotiate peace in Bosnia, but in a big room, oh, you know, oh boy, she's t t nervous. I could see her across the big baronial table. There's a lot of notable people there. They, they make her stand up and say something. It's, it's painful. I can't help her. She's over there. <laughs> and so she stands up, which actually people didn't realize because she's only that tall. Like, you <laughs> can imagine where I came from at my height. And, uh, and she says, I suppose at this point, she's from Brooklyn, I, I, I guess uh, it's okay at this point that you didn't go to law school. That's all she says, that's it. <laughs> Brings down the house. <laughs> this is a motivational methodology. I'm looking around the room, I can see there's some adherence of it probably here. Uh, you know, and I sat down, and a buddy of mine sitting next to me, and he goes, y you ever think about that, that it wasn't okay for you to be a journalist until after you actually had the Pulitzer in your hand? I said, yeah, actually, yeah, I have thought about it, you know, uh, across 10 years of therapy. So, uh, <laughs> well, boy, I am so happy to be here. This has been a harrowing day. Um, you know, we've done a bunch of these over the years. It's funny when Ken talks about the long procession. Uh, we've had these public uh, encounters with, I bet some of you have been to some other ones, um, at times of great change, you know, the Chinese say it's a curse to live in interesting times, and we have been. And we've been here trying to figure out uh, what we can uh, rely on as Americans, often in rooms like this. Um, so I'll talk for a little while, and then we'll mix it up. Because that's what I love. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not just saying this, but I, I probably get more than I could give. The nourishment I get from the exchange, especially with a crowd like this, uh, is, a, is a lovely thing. Is there, I just, I, let me just say, though, that as I kind of, you know, I've been, I've been in apostolic Pentecostal churches a lot, writing A Hope in the Unseen, and I still go once in a while, which is a big stretch for a Jewish guy. And, uh, but they just kind of testify. And I'm like, I love that. <laughs> we Jews need to do more of that. <laughs> Throw the notes away. Feel it. Say it. And actually, I had on the plane coming up a moment today. You know, I'll tell you why I'm late, or how I barely made it here. It was a close call. You know, I left Washington uh, at 9 o'clock. Yeah, I know. In the morning, today, this morning. Stopped at LaGuardia, because we were doing the Hanover, the hop to Hanover. God, when can we please give us an airline flying in and out of Lebanon? My God. But it wasn't to be so in at LaGuardia. I got on the next hop, and we floated over New Hampshire for about three hours. <laughs> but what's interesting is that uh, we're on the little plane. You probably know the plane. It's the Kogan Air thing, right? The little one? OK. Now that's actually, uh, I was sitting, it was, it was all, it was very elegant and it was quite representative of everything. I mean, I'm sitting in the front seat of the little sausage there. There's about, you know, 10 seats on a side. So I've got the, the front seat, and, and they don't close the cabin door, I, or they didn't. I guess they assumed there were no terrorists aboard. And, uh, and so the pilot's right up there, and it's just teeming at LaGuardia. It is just, it's, a, it's, it's biblical. That bad. I mean, you know, they had a, they, as soon as we took off, they had a ground stop, I think. But, but you know, basically we're there, and the pilot is sitting right there. And, and uh, all of a sudden, I see him reach over to the side, and we're in a, uh, we're in a, a, a beach 1900. Beechcraft. Because he pulled out the manual <laughs> to the plane. <laughs> That's how I know that. <laughs> I'm like, dude, he's reading the manual. We are in a typhoon. 
And this guy is looking a little befuddled, he's reading the manual for the plane. <laughs> what do you do? What do you do at that moment? You think of your wife, your kids, and you say, I'm getting off of here. Let me out. But I didn't. I sat. And he became more confused. And then I looked out, and the guy with the little things was going, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's giving the what are you doing sign. It's like that. <laughs> and I realized this is kind of what I do. This is actually my real life. I happen to have the front seat. Now, there are a lot of people behind me. The plane is full, and I can see the pilot, OK? And so I turn to someone behind me and go, he's reading the manual. <laughs> and that guy sends a message back. And all of a sudden, everyone on the plane knows the pilot's reading the manual. This is actually my real life. You know, what I do in my job. I'm close enough to the pilot. In this case, I think you know who I mean. <laughs> and I can see him right up there. It's a Herodotus perch, I guess you'd say, right? You know, Herodotus had a lovely, elegant idea that there's a perfect spot to see in those days the Parthenon just completed before he died in its fullness, in the sweep of the Athenian hills, in its fine detail and artistry. And that's what I look for, a Herodotus perch. And now I've got one on the beach 1900. <laughs> and I send the message back. At this moment, I am having a George Bush moment. <laughs> now, sending back that information causes grievous concern, but no action. I've had that sensation as well. <laughs> and suddenly, I'm sort of selected by the rest of the passengers as something of their representative to the pilot. Go up and ask them what's going on. <laughs> That's also my life, kind of. Well, suffice to say, we take off. The cabin door remains open. It's a harrowing flight. The pilot is befuddled. He doesn't want to show me that. He's clearly a believer, a believer in confidence, this pilot, in the mystical power of confidence. I think you know what I'm saying. I think you do. <laughs> but he wants to comfort us in, <laughs> in Beechcraft America. So at some point he tells us, well, uh, this isn't going so well, but I got plenty of fuel. And there we are in a storm, having to trust this man at the controls with everything at stake. And he has not earned my confidence. In fact, it's the opposite. <laughs> and all I'm doing is I sit there feeling powerless, is I'm looking at the back of the tray table, because they got a little message there. <laughs> Use seat cushion as flotation device. <laughs> I think that one little patch of plastic pretty much sums up a whole giant effort of the government called Homeland Security. That's pretty much it. That one little line. <laughs> the first responders and all of that. <laughs> you know, has anyone ever used the seat cushion as a flotation device? <laughs> when you're in a plane going 300 miles an hour into something. <laughs> you 
And as I sit there thinking about the extraordinary day it has been in the land of informed consent, I say essentially what the passengers of Beechcraft 1900 did all together, knowing that the pilot was reading the manual, knowing that the lessons did not seem to sink in, we decided he would get a new co-pilot, that he would not fly the plane as he has been by himself. Our designee, the people's designee, will now join him in a partnership to fly this plane. And that gives me modest comfort, though my confidence still needs to be earned. Suffice to say, we did land. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm ready to give the pilot much credit on that, though. What is it that, um, that we're entitled to know, really? Am I entitled to know everything about flying a plane, for instance? Am I entitled to know everything that that pilot flying this plane, our plane, knows? How he comes to his decisions to hit that button and not that one? What he's seeing on his screen? What the risk analysis is for whether or not our gas will run out? If these things were clear, we would not be here today, I don't think. What do we demand of our leaders? What do we expect in return? What is the nature of informed consent? It's a sacred, lovely phrase, a principle, a writ. With emphasis in particular, the founders would say, if one of them were here with their powdered wigs, on the word informed. I start the book, this book, with an epigram from Jefferson that is odd and fascinating in its conditionality. When the people are informed, then they can be trusted with their government. There's tension in that phrase. When? Almost all the leaders in my lifetime, and I'm looking around the room, maybe in, in some of your lifetimes too, stretching back a little further, believed that informed was a goal packaged into their job. You know, Reagan isn't loving the press. Carter isn't saying, how often can I meet with them? They're all saying, it's just part of my job. I work for them, us, you. And if they're going to give me a performance review on some regular kind of interval, the bosses, they need to pretty much know why I do what I do. So what's our rotation, you know? You know, Jody Powell. What's our rotation? Mike Deaver. Okay, we got the Times this week, and then the Post guys are coming two weeks from now. Oh, God, I hate those bastards. And then, uh, and then Time Magazine, and then you got the CBS thing, and that's just the way it is. Among the many innovations of the group that has been ruling America with their tactical forcefulness for these years, among their many innovations, is to say, well, uh-huh, I understand that, but why is that the case? Huh, is it written anywhere that I have to actually engage with the so-called mainstream media because they're just, they're pains in my butt? 
We have a new thing that we've built up and it's been lovely and it's happened over a few years, but now it's in a fullness, it's fruition, a friendly media. That's new, right? They will be a perfect avenue for message. Oh, message. The holy grail, message. What is message? What is it? Message is a couple guys sitting around saying, well, whatever we believe, this is what we're going to say. And we're going to repeat it again and again and again. And what we're going to do is make sure no one has the ammunition, the nourishment, the stuff to challenge us with the pertinent data. That's the key. You kill off all avenues for the impromptu question, the educated, unexpected thrust that gets in the way of message. How do you do that? Well, Dick's been very good at it. What he's done is he said, first off, uh, nothing we do, anyone should know, ever. None of our deliberations, none of them. From the first, I wrote about this in Price of Loyalty, the Energy Commission meetings, you know, Dick's Energy Commission. Cut it off. The deliberative process is nobody's business. You will judge us based on our actions. That's the way we've decided it should be. What does that do? Well, it cuts off the stuff, the manna, that allows for the informed question, which is a cousin of informed consent. Kill it. Classify everything. This is not a 9-11 thing. They started it from the first day. Everything down to the lunch menu. Classified. And terrible menus at that. Because then there's not the stuff the stuff of informed consent. Deny access to the president. That's our business. I sat with Karen Hughes in the West Wing in 2002 when I was in there, when they allowed me in the building before that restraining order. And, uh, <laughs> and she basically said, look, we're just going to ignore you people in the mainstream media. We don't think we're going to suffer any penalty for that. Up to now, we haven't. This is February, March 2002. The president has a 90% approval rating. She told me a story. I heard it again from someone else. Perfect story. The New York Times Magazine editor, Jerry Maserati, I write there once in a while, Jerry's in there with Karen Hughes at the very beginning of the administration. It's a lovely little moment. And Jerry's there and saying, look, we wrote a great piece in the New York Times Magazine on Gerald Ford. He had a copy of the old yellowed thing. Jerry holds it up. And I think John Hersey, some big name, sort of Bigfoot writer, wrote it. And it's like this, Karen, he tells her, it's right there in the West Wing, this was the definitive piece on Ford. Historians for years, hence, turned to it. And it wasn't good or bad, it was so, and real, and it framed the debates, and here it is. And it only took two weeks of the reporter being in and around the president, okay? Karen reaches into her drawer, pulls out Time Magazine, all right, holds it up. It's got Bush right there in the cover doing the, you know, the pointing thing. You know, he's big on the pointing, you know, that pose. He said, this is a really good piece for us. This cost me 17 minutes. We have been out of equilibrium since 9-11. Not just the fourth estate, but other parts of our properly and judiciously divided and separated government. Congress, the courts, the unitary executive, so-called, that's their principle. They came with it. They didn't come up with it there. This was part of the design, preparation, unitary executive, Expansion of executive powers met opportunity at 9-11. Make no mistake. It has thrown out of kilter, out of equilibrium, so much that is effective in the self-governance process. There are self-correcting features knitted into it. The founders, they were brilliant about this. Those instruments have been broken, overwhelmed. That goes not just for the courts, Congress, and our official, unofficial role.
we are getting now, in 2006, some modest corrections. Those self-correcting features of self-governance are activating. And it lifts my heart. There will be a battle up ahead on these military commissions at the Supreme Court. It will happen relatively soon. We'll see what the court does. The long and short of that, as you know, is in Hamdi, the court made its ruling, threw it back to the administration, said, go consult with Congress, look at what we said. And then the military commissions, despite John McCain's posturing, which gave a lot of people, and Lindsey Graham, a JAG, I mean, it was a nice group. Warner got some chits, some cred. Shockingly enough, well, they all basically got steamrolled at the final hour. And those commissions are, in letter and verse, exactly what the Supreme Court said you can't do. So there will be a battle there. More importantly, today, there are people in the House of Representatives, shockingly enough, with subpoena power. God. Wow, it's going to be an interesting two years. Don't expect too much. Progressives have a problem with that. They expect a lot. There's so much to do. They're so agitated. <laughs> Not much of it. The administration will simply say, talk to the hand. <laughs> They're going to probably have a big inflatable one in the East Lawn of the White House. And you want to go to the court? Go to the court. Be my guest. And we'll run out the clock. I met with a bunch of Democratic senators after the book came out. We do a thing, um, a lunch in the Senate, some Republicans too, that was a different lunch. And the Democrats were there. Um, there was an appropriations committee markup, so a few of them got siphoned off, but a pretty good crowd. You know, and I looked at them, and they didn't inspire a, a ton of hope. <laughs> it was a couple months ago. We had some Q&A, they're just addled with Bush. There's obsessions here. They can't get him out of their head. You know, and I said to them, I said, you know, I said, I, I was driving just a week before with my mother, this woman I've mentioned, this ferocious little Floridian, and my aunt, who's a little older than my mom, they were sitting in the back seat of the car. I was chauffeuring them around the sort of Washington suburbs. And they were parceling up 50 plus years of knowing one another. And who did what to whom? And then there's that, and of course, you remember that bar mitzvah present. It was Bupkis. <laughs> that boom, ba boom. It was an amazingly high level discussion. <laughs> Hundreds of people involved. Judgments cast with just sharp edge. <laughs> and as I drive them, <laughs> I look in the rearview mirror, <laughs> and I say, I feel like I'm the chauffeur <laughs> for woulda, coulda, and shoulda life accountants. And of course, I see them through the rear view mirror. And I tell our friends, the senators, I said, you know, if I were in your shoes, I would expunge the words woulda, coulda, and shoulda from your vocabularies now. There's nothing that people can learn from you on that. Nothing 
that will not be viewed as self-interested. What you need, and my business is not to give you advice, so this is not real advice. What you need, what any leader needs at this moment is an action plan that enough of you agree about that it seems like the possible. Hmm. And we left the lunch and, and one of the senators grabbed me and said, come back with me to my office. Let's talk. Who do you think that was? Hint, it was a woman. Different haircut than the senator from New York. I am hopeful today. I am hopeful because at day's end, the hard work of informed consent, properly nourished, fitfully, often irregularly nourished, at some extreme pain, informed consent has shown its teeth today. That heartens me. What heartens me is that the day after I wrote a New York Times Magazine story in October 2004 that helped launch a specific phrase in the lexicon, that phrase, of course, uh, if you just Google it, you'll see it. Uh, a White House advisor said to me, Ron, they were aggrieved at what I had written. He said, Ron, guys like you are in what we call the reality-based community. <laughs> I had written some things they didn't like, and so they took me aside uh, and thought I could be educated, okay? This was 2002. We were talking at that moment, the advisor and myself, and he, this person, I had said he, will remain nameless for all time. They have called and said, we have a deal. I said, yes, we have a deal. There's not even a, if you were to die thing, like Woodward, none of that. We're talking about global news cycles, how different it is now. You know, when I was a kid, there was a foreign message and a domestic message. You know, every dusty village wasn't wired with an internet hookup and lots of cheap devices to get the images flowing. No, no. They couldn't see us over there, really. Now they can. And you put it in the pipeline, drop it in the chute, <laughs> CNN, Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, and then it's right back. 30 seconds, a minute. That's what we were talking about, the advisor and myself. At which point he said, yeah. And I said, I understand that. I'm sometimes part of that. But aren't the right answers? Isn't that the most important thing? arriving at the right answer through the traditional method of search and find. <laughs> then he holds up and says that I, and some of you I'm just guessing, are members of the reality-based community. Congratulations. I said, well, define it for me. If I'm a member of it, I ought to at least know what it is. He says, well, you <clears throat> all believe the solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I think I've got a tradition behind me. I'm, I'm just guessing, but enlightenment principles, age of reason, it goes their antecedents going way. Oh, no, we know, we know. But that's um, not the way the world really works anymore. <sighs> You see, we're kind of an empire now. And when we act, and it gets swept up, those messages, we create 
our own reality. And you'll study that judiciously as you will, you poor little RBC, or they got an acronym, the reality basically, it's RBC. They have a, it's distilled down already. And you'll study that judiciously, yes you will. And then we'll act again. You can study that reality too. And then we'll act the third time. And you can study that one as well. And that's the way it'll all sort out. You see, we're history's actors because we have the temerity to do what's needed. And you'll be left to study what we do. And he said something that I didn't put in the New York Times magazine, the end of this quote, I'll offer it to you because you're kind of involved. And he said, you know, and if you start being nice to us, which you haven't been, maybe one of us will deign to visit you a decade or two from now up there at Dartmouth where you hang out in your tattered twee blazer. I got a new wardrobe that morning. And um, <laughs> I said, God, you really are angry at me, aren't you? He's like, yes, we are. The president is angry at you. You are a nuisance to him. I said, just come to my office any day you choose. We'll do it nice and quiet, all right? Pick out any book on the shelf marked history. Take any one of them. Read it, and you'll find that people who believe what you just said end up in history's dustbin. They're not getting speaking gigs either. <laughs> God knows Dartmouth won't pay for them. So, <laughs> here's what heartens me. The next morning, after the Times piece, there were four separate sites on the internet, companies producing <laughs> proud member of the reality-based community t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, four separate ones. I had my assistant call up and I got a bunch of boxes in my office now. I said, I have sort of paternity on the phrase and can I have a box or two? So sometimes when I meet with a source, some of them notable people, some of them not, but a source who is bending toward the light of knowledge and maybe acquired wisdom, well, sometimes I bring them a t-shirt. <laughs> and I will report to you now, without getting too specific, that Colin Powell's got a shirt. <laughs> Brent Scowcroft's got a shirt. A lot of people have shirts. And the fact is, yesterday, I think a couple million people were wearing shirts. And that's why it was a good day for democracy. Questions? Thank you very much. I'll do the question because I want to get yeah. As is our tradition here uh, in the question and answers, I'd like to recognize students first. So if a student has a question, let's go at it. Student. Come on, students. Come on, you know what your parents are paying for you to be here? <laughs> OK, OK, OK. Uh, uh, letter of recommendation to graduate school. Here, I, I, that's <laughs> first question. Yeah, student. Stand up. State your name. Uh, Alex Sherman. Uh, Al? Alex. Alex. Hey, Alex. How are you? Uh, how do you feel about Robert Gates' uh, nomination? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> amazing all that's happening today. Isn't it amazing? God, God. <laughs> I mean, you didn't know what Bush was going to do, did you? I mean, you all thought, you know, there's Pelosi up there doing her, you know, thing that drives them insane, you know, my God. I mean, you know, the fact is, she was the biggest poster of this election season. 
Speaker Pelosi. They thought that would energize the Republican base. Didn't quite do enough. And there she is doing it. And what's Bush going to say? Well, you know, he gets out there and, and he says, uh, I'm ready to work with the Speaker. <laughs> you just want to say, <laughs> warning, warning, warning. <laughs> I won't get into any nasty analogies here, but. So do you have lunch often with Joe Stalin? Yeah, uh, once a week. Um, be careful. Um, look, they have had uh, an extraordinary array, a bipartisan array of people who have uh, stood up, uh, Republicans leading, to say, just please fire the guy. Just think of all the goodness that will accrue to you, Mr. President, just getting rid of them. You know, look, the fact is, is that I wrote a book called The Price of Loyalty. O'Neill was the main character. But Don Rumsfeld is our main character under that rubric. How is it possible he's here at this point, leaving the building? Gates, he's an intelligence guy. And intelligence is going to be crucial. Gates knows intelligence. And maybe this is somebody advising the president to say, largely, we're involved going forward, not in a land war, you know, in the center of the Arab world, but in an intelligence war. I say fine to that. But we are involved in a war with boots on the ground in the middle of the Arab world. And I'm not sure if Gates is the guy to help us out of that. You know, I just wonder if this was Jimmy Baker's nominee or not. You know, I think that if you went to the 41 crowd in Baker, I think they probably would have picked someone else. And I would pretty much go with their pick. It's a mess. And you're going to need someone with enormous acuity and force of personality to deal with uh, essentially the, you know, my God, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, they're like, at this point, they're like battered wives. They, you know, they need therapy. It's a mess. They flinch. They're flinching. You need someone who can manage that. I just, Suzanne, I'm sorry. I got OK, next question. You, another student. Stand up. What's your name? Angel Castillo, class of 2010. Angel? Yes. Angel. Uh, how, much do you, how much do you think uh, the Bush administration is responsible for the reduction in journalistic aggression as opposed to the media organizations themselves? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, boy. Hey, Angel. And, uh, yeah, boy, yeah. It's, just see me afterward, Angel. You know, it's a kind of a sour codependency angel, I'm sad to say. You know, they leveraged the prerogatives of power with a kind of tactical forcefulness and clarity of purpose that the fourth estate had not seen up to now. They did. You know, they looked at us like, uh, like just another special interest group in Washington. That's the way they viewed us. You guys are just like the healthcare lobby. You got no special role. I know you got a seed on the Bill of Rights. I know you got your little thing there. But that doesn't matter to us. What does that have to do with me? That's a mantra. Yes, yes, yes. But what does that have to do with me? History starts the moment I step on the stage. That's the view in the white building. And so what they said was, huh, what is it that drives these journals? What's the manner? What's the, the, the sort of transactional uh, element here? It's access. Deny them access. And then access, based on laws of scarcity, becomes more valuable. All right? And we will be able to leverage its offering, its dolloping out. You want to see the president? Here are the three things you can talk about. 
And that malaprop, the president said midway, you're not putting that in, are you? We good? You want to come back or have the chance to possibly audition for a return? That's the way it works. Thank God, the guy who I grew up viewing as a hero, Bob Woodward, kind of came around on this last one. He got it. You know, I talked to Hal Raines at one point. I had to speak at the New York Times or some testimonial for a guy I used to work for there. And, uh, and it was when Raines was still at the Times and sort of talking, you know, doing his Bigfoot inspirational leader thing. Uh, and I said, you know, geez, Hal, you know, we in the Fourth Estate, we need some new strategies here. They've come up with a playbook. And we're using the same old playbook. It's the same thing we run into with the terrorists. I mean, I don't want to equate the whites with the terrorists, but the concept <laughs> that we're using the old playbook in Iraq and in the war on terror, old playbooks, not new ones. Well, they've come up with a new playbook, but we're using the same old one. The same old one, grab as many reporters as you can and fling them, throw them at the wall, you know, and eventually one will get over and that's your story. Well, what they did is they added about 20 feet to the wall. So now everyone's walking back, their foreheads are bloody, they got nothing. I said, we need a new strategy, i.e., if a reporter is denied access, because that's what they, they hold over your head, they know it. They say, oh, how long did it take you, Bill, to become the White House correspondent for Newspaper X? Yeah, about 10 years, huh? Now, I saw you in that Washington Speaker thing. You're doing, you get about 4,000, 5,000 bucks a speech, don't you? Yeah. But you know, if you do what you did today again, you're out. No one will ever call you, ever. You'll be covering EPA. So before you exhibit similar temerity again, I think you might want to talk to your wife. Got it? If anyone's denied access by this White House, that should be bonus time. That should be, here's a nice chunk of change. You can go write feature stories for three years. That's strategy. And it has been incredibly successful. And I'll finally say this, only this, this is the thing that concerns me. A buddy of mine, a Democratic chieftain, said, oh boy, those guys, they are good. And I just hope if we ever get the big white building back, they'll leave that playbook behind. The stakes are huge. Tactics will be repeated by those in authority until they can be shown to be ineffective. Make no mistake. Next question. Another student? You, next door. What's your name? Uh, Dylan Matthews. What is it? Dylan. Hi, Dylan. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I was wondering if you've heard about this new book that uh, John Mueller, who's a professor at Ohio State, put out, um, basically arguing that the terrorist threat is a sham that's been overblown. Yeah. Um, I, I was wondering if you've done extensive reporting on the war on terror. I was wondering what you make of that. Yeah. He's, he's wrong. He's wrong. <laughs> Don't get the book. Call uh, John Mueller. Call up, uh, uh, go into uh, Google, you'll see a big paper he wrote on it for, for, yeah, foreign policy, I think, foreign affairs, he wrote it in foreign affairs. You'll see the whole thing. It's basically saying they haven't attacked us and it's a figment of our imagination. I just happen to know that it's just not the case. And I know it uh, through all manner of investigation as to what we know and how we know it. Um, in fact, I am of the mind that we are probably more vulnerable now than we were on September the 12th. I, I, I am absolutely certain of that. And it's not because I sat around and talked about it with my wife. It's because a steady stream of intelligence officials, some in the government, some not, have been coming to me at neutral locations terrified and these are people who don't want to be terrified. They want to be able to sleep at night. They want to be able to go to their kids' baseball games, and they're terrified. 
You know, the short of it, the elevator speech on it, is that if you want to understand what happened here, go back to September the 12th. Use as a marker that in the days after 9-11, there were candlelight vigils in Tehran in support of America, in solidarity. Every significant Muslim cleric, and the clerics matter here, because Islamic action is born of Sharia, born of Islamic law. It's different than here. It's, you know, look, go back to, you know, the 1500s with the European, you know, Jewish communities where the rabbi ran it. I can't go back there myself, but you might. That's what we're talking about. All of them condemned the t attack, all of them. It was outside of Islamic law. You don't wound women and children. It's in the Quran. It's part of what the prophet says. Or injure Muslims. Well, Muslims and women and children were killed on September the 11th. They condemned it. There's been pushback since. On that day, we, as the most powerful nation on the planet, had support. Everyone, not just our old buddies, but some new friends, some people saying, I can't believe I'm saying this, but here I am in God knows Yemen and Sudan and other places where you don't want to meet them in daylight. They're saying, what can I do to help? That was our moment. Okay? We leverage some of those assets. Make no mistake. And a lot of that's in this book. We don't just build the web of signal intelligence. I think that's overstated. It gets a lot of publicity. People feel like their rights are being violated. They are in a way. But you know, the fact is, the key, the key to this is the human intelligence. That's what wins these kinds of battles. When you're dealing with a low-grade global insurgency, you need sources in their camp. We built them in those first 18 months. I've got them in the book. I was shocked when I heard that. Joyous. We had a source inside of Al-Qaeda. I call him Ali in the book. From late 2002 to early 2005, we decommissioned him because we thought he might get caught. We had a guy saying just what that guy said in London that helped foil those London bombings. He said, you know, I think bin Laden made a mistake here. We didn't, Americans, get caught in a quagmire in Afghanistan as bin Laden predicted. In fact, the structure of al-Qaeda was scattered, so some of the niceties of their life as they moved to Iran and Yemen and everywhere else got disrupted. People didn't like that in the ruling group. There was dissension. There was backbiting. There was second guessing. That's the seedbed of victory. Just ask the Brits with the IRA. That's the way you win them. All of a sudden, they don't know who to trust. And we have a source in there. How do we get college Sheikh Mohammed? It wasn't what the president said in the East Room in, in August. That was wrong. That was false. He knew it. He said, we got information from Abu Zubaydah, who he tortured, an insane man. And that's what helped us catch KSM. False. The only way you can say that is if you know a lot of classified information. And I happen to know some. So it was a source who turned him in. Someone said, this is not my Islam. And guess what? I'm meeting with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the 9-11 planner, tonight. And $25 million, boy, I really could use that money. And that guy is now living in America, never to be found, and with his wife and his kids and cousins, one through three, four layers of cousins. We need to multiply that guy times 100. That's where we were. If you want to say, were we winning this so-called war on terror, if you define it as a war, a new kind of war, however you define it, we probably were winning in late 2002, early 2003. But then, here we go. But then we turn fiercely into a new direction, Iraq. You can almost mark by the day how our human intelligence assets have withered on the vine since then. That guy in England, who after the July 7th bombings, 2005, in London, that brought London to his knees, he said, 
this is not my Islam. Who was that guy? He was an Islamist. He's a fundamentalist. And what did he do? He was close enough to the jihadists who were operational to hear something pertinent. He went to British authorities. That's what saved our bacon here. The chances now, three years after the Iraq debacle, after the United States is seen, not just by our enemies, but even by our friends as reckless and angry, and God knows you can't trust them, and all they do is bait and switch, and just stay clear of them. The chance of someone who is a jihadist close enough to the bad guys to hear something pertinent coming to us now? Zero. Meanwhile, the jihadist threat has metastasized. Bin Laden can retire to the cave at this point. He's an ism. The idea of violent ideology carrying forward historical change, it's everywhere. It's spored. So what do you have now? You've got groups all over the place. We don't know where they are. It's called, I call it Amway terrorism. They're going double diamond direct. Franchisees, they don't need to check in with home office. They don't need money, they're self-supporting, they don't need direction. You can get a lot of that just by reading and by the various websites they have exclusive access to. And they don't need technical advice or assistance and they're almost impossible to find before their operational moment and they have multiplied. Frankly, anti-Americanism, if a thousand people are angry at America and 10 of them turn to violence, that's a lot of people, but we're up to that. If it ends up being 4,000, which is what's been happening, and maybe a larger percentage, two, three, four percent, maybe now you have 100 people out of 1,000, or 100 people out of 2,000. All of a sudden you're starting to deal with an army that we cannot match in a world where you download and click anything. You can get anything now. That's where we are. And Bush back when says, bring it on, bring them on. And he said, that's the one thing he regrets saying. Well, you know, he's still saying it in his way. He's still doing that same posture. You know, the bully gets beaten up by the whole gang. He's bloody. He gets up. He dusts himself off. The whole playground of kids are going, huh. And he's going, come on. Who's next? You know, sometimes the bully learns. He goes off into the corner, he licks his wounds, he gets some band-aids, and he says, you know, I messed up. Let's go get a Slurpee. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We've got two years left in this presidency. Sometimes presidents feel urges at this point. They say history's judgment's the only one I care about. I'm not going to stand for another election. They pull their little nicks into Chinas. They go to the improbable place. We're seeing it today with the press conference. Will the president move down that evolutionary path or not? Another question. Oh, hi. hi. Another student? Yep. Hi, what's your name? Oh, 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 right. question. Uh, in what ways has the increased access Exposure to uh, satire influenced or affected uh, the media and the policy. Mm, that's good. Everyone hear that? The uh, increased heightened satire shtick, the power shtick. Look, the fact is, there's, there's somebody, a wise person, who said a laugh can cut down a dictator and raise a mountain. And I think uh, we're seeing uh, the effects of some of that. I know I have an 18 year old son, he gets a lot of his information from The Daily Show. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was on The Colbert Show um, a couple, uh, like two months ago. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the fact that I survived it is a feat. <laughs> I've never been. <laughs> OK, I'll just tell you a short story, because it's actually pretty funny. The, uh, uh, I, I told a buddy of mine I was going on, and he's like a real TV guy. He's, you know, he's a, he, was, he has a show on the Food Channel, or he did. And he's like, have you, uh, have you really watched uh, Colbert 
all the way through the show. I said, no, I've watched them, you know. He's like, no, no, you watch the monologue and you go to sleep, right? I said, actually, yes. Well, you need to watch the interviews because your reputation could be, tra I mean, you'd be over if it doesn't work. You'd, be, you know, you'd have to retire. And so he sent me about 10 citations uh, on YouTube of Colbert moments. <laughs> and it just saved my life, basically. <laughs> you know, I saw a prominent, credible, responsible leaders um, ruined on the Colbert Hour. <laughs> and they don't get it. Now, when you go on the show, they try to help. They say to you, I'll tell you, that, you know, obviously, everyone knows Colbert. Colbert is, uh, you know, you should, well, it's on 1130, so, you know, that night, I don't know, drink a couple espressos at eight and you'll be good. And, uh, and basically, uh, he's a fictional character, all right? And he's created this amazing upside down universe of which he is the king. He impersonates kind of a Bill O'Reilly, conservative, kind of, you know, faith-based, kind of petulant, you know, patriotic. And he brings in a lot of the narcissistic TV stuff. It's an amazing act. And he's a little like Borat, you know, it's very similar. It's utterly post, post, postmodern, amazing, upside down. Now, now and, and you know, and all the other people have done it, but it's amazing to watch. And so basically he gets you on the show, and you're in the green room, and the producer comes up and she gives you advice to help you. She says, take his character seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. I'm like, oh God. <laughs> I feel I feel like I feel like I'm sitting with a Buddhist monk or something. <laughs> How am I drawing that line? Okay, got it. He's like a child, she tells me. A petulant child? Um, uninformed child? In the body of an adult. So you should correct him. But, but don't correct him in any way that even hints of condescension. Huh. <laughs> I'm drawing that line too. <laughs> now, mind you, before I went on the show, I talked to Frank Rich, who said, oh, God, you're going on tonight? Have you prepared? <laughs> it was the most harrowing six minutes of my life. <laughs> and so you go on, and you realize when you're on the show, is that Colbert is the king of this universe. As he runs down from his desk and he does the high five with the audience, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you might as well be in a, in a, you know, you're a Christian and there are lions every, I mean, you're, you're, in, a, you're in an arena. <laughs> and I'll say one guest, I won't, you have to YouTube this yourself because I don't want to add to this guy's woes, but one guest I saw on YouTube. Huh. It's a prominent person, confident, and feels like he's a very funny guy. Now, he might be funny in front of crowds like this. That's a different thing. Colbert is at the top of Funny Mountain. <laughs> That's a really high mountain. We're in the lowlands, people like me. So he's ready. He feels like he's prepared. Now, it's early Colbert, mind you, so he is not really clear what's happening. So what he does is, <laughs> The poor son of a bitch. He, <laughs> he comes on with jokes. Oh, I mean, already you're like, oh, save him. Someone save him. And he tells a joke. Got it prepared, worked on it. Maybe called a few friends. And Colbert sits there. Now, he owns that studio audience. And beyond them, the audience is in their bedrooms at that point at the night, in the night. And he owns them all. And he owns them with the tiniest change in his physiognomy. You know, his mouth moves, they move. <laughs> his eyebrow goes up, their eyebrows go up. It's like massive ventriloquism. <laughs> and so as this guest tells his first joke, <laughs> Colbert's face does not budge. The studio audience is quiet as a crypt. The guest starts to sweat. <laughs> here and here a little bit. And then he's, but he's got three jokes. So he goes with joke two. <laughs> Someone help this man! Joke two! <laughs> 
At this point, it's silence. It's like a physicist would study this silence. It is so absolute. You just <laughs> Joke three. Now, he's gone about two minutes with the jokes, and there's not a peep. Colbert's face has not changed. And then after joke three, Colbert goes, oh, wait, you, you're quite a jokester, aren't you? <sighs> the gales of laughter <laughs> were so pronounced <laughs> that it must up this guy's perfect hair. And he just, uh, he, he couldn't speak for the next four minutes. That's what humor can do. And I just say in my dream, just imagine George Bush going on the Colbert Report. <laughs> okay, another question. Come on, come on. Oh, yeah, hi, how are you? How is that fire? Was this was the result? Well, the suggestion was I think we've come around. I think you know, after a while, you're whacked on the head enough times, you learn. And I think the the media finally said that the presumptions that I brought to my job covering this administration, I must now abandon. And, and my model, my method, actually has been used by some other people. What I did at the start, because I, um, the first person to leave the White House and to speak with some clarity, with direct access to the president, is a guy named John DiUlio, the head of the faith-based program. He was one of my guys. And then after that is Paul O'Neill, and after that with this book there's a whole bunch of people. My idea is basically you get a former official, you find them in some uh, neutral place, and uh, you get close to them and you hit them on the head and you throw them in your trunk. <laughs> you drive fast to your office, <laughs> you give them a shot of sodium pentothal, and you begin the deprogramming therapy. That's kind of what I do. And after a while they go, oh, God. It's like they were members of, you know, what was it, the, the Unification Church. I mean, you know, they were like, wow, really? And you talk about America for a long time. Don't be too product oriented. Go with process. It's therapy. And so you talk about American exceptionalism. You talk about the issues of informed consent. You talk about how truth works. I say to them things like, I say truth works in so many parts of your life between your relations with your wife or your husband, relations between citizens and their government, bosses and their employees, it works. It's messy, it's improbable, it is as difficult to control as ocean currents. But at day's end, you don't have to remember what you said. At day's end, you can stand up tall, in daylight, you can look anyone else right in the eye, and you deserve that. Try it. And the amazing thing that's happened is that the more people who try it and survive it, the more message, the cult of message, gets pushed back. And they call me later, and they go, God, I can't believe it. Once I was a, a leading official, credible. I had earned my place. I would run a Fortune 500 company. I had written all the papers people read. I was hailed. I was a grown up. And then I got in there, and they said, children are seen and not heard. And I know that you think you have answers, but you know, we don't believe there are right answers. The right answers are what we decide they are. We don't need your policy process. That's messy. It often ends up in places that Carl doesn't like. So you know, the fact is, you're here to repeat this message. He says, that's who I was. And I didn't feel like myself. 
and I couldn't look my husband or wife in the eye. And now I'm me again. And I get hugged by cab drivers. <laughs> and back then, I couldn't even hail a cab. <laughs> and they build. That's why truth only need rear its head. Should we finish up? One more question. And then afterwards, there's going to be a man who will be doing book signing and purchases. But anybody, one last question. <laughs> you, yes. Have you decided how democracy is going to survive terrorism? God, <laughs> yes. Not well. Look, the fact is, on terrorism, we have a huge problem, which we've alluded to some tonight, but I'll hit it right in the head now. Here's the problem. Almost any struggle we have with these terrorists, and this is a huge historical change, it really is. Anyone who's studied history will say, now let me think. Now you have individuals and small groups born of the miracle of the information age, and it has empowered people all over the world. Small groups, individuals, can now hold, like Promethean theft, the destructive power once reserved for nations. Wow. What does that do to the long millennial history of the state-to-state -state dance of force and diplomacy? It turns it on its head. There is a democratizing energy that has seized the world in this modern era, born of knowledge. All that's good we know, but a destructive cousin has been brought to the party. Destructive capability. What do we do? We have to almost by needs fight a war, if you call it a war, that is understandably going to be done at least significantly in secret. Think of the conflict of that term, a secret war. Wars tend to be big public noisy things. You got correspondence, you got Ed Murrow or Matt Brady, they're sending back dispatches. You're checking troop rotations, casualty reports. This one will be fought in secret. What does that do? It hands the government on this most portentous issue of war and peace a kind of latitude to say, I will decide what you need to know on this more, most portentous issue. My decision. You receive a mess. If I was a benign dictator for a day, I would get together a, a group of, of older men and women who had really served, who then were at the point of wisdom to decide what we are entitled to know as soon as we're entitled to know it. So we're not in a situation like we were again and again over the past few years, like we were just a few months ago, where I watched Bush in the East Room, and I'm like, he's doing it again, exhibiting creative license with classified information. There should be a crime again. That should be a crime. Democracy is profoundly challenged by fear. We need to go right at the source of it. And I'm hoping to do that as the years pass. What is the nature of the threat? How, how do you sit across the table from a young jihadist who is looking at the hand he's been dealt, who is reading and breathing the ideology of martyrdom and saying, hmm, which way do I go? Do I go down that path? Or is there another path? Know thine enemy. Ancient wisdom. Because in it are the seeds of both victory and mercy. We need to have a different conversation so that that young jihadist is saying, yeah, but I'd rather not. Yeah, but there's actually another path I'm going to take. Yeah, but the United States has embraced, let's just say, a less transactional idea of foreign policy. You know, the kind that we use for the Marshall Plan, the kind Truman talks about. When you're as strong as we are, don't load in the conditions. Just do it because it's the right thing. These are desperately poor countries that we now are in a civilizational conflict with. You know, 
blunted aspirations, twisted up notions of urge and desire. We need to solve that, help solve it, at least try to solve it, at least move down that path in some way if we are going to blunt Frankly, the situation we're in where we have a tactical issue, where they have a tactical updraft that we're not able to challenge. And if we start to do that, if we start to embrace transparency because we're having that kind of a discussion, instead of fear and secrecy, democracy will be less challenged. We can say, I want to rise to the level of informed consent. We're not going to get there, but let's get closer. And what it means is for us to have ownership of this thing. That's going to be the key. That we will look with a kind of familiarity on issues like intelligence, like uh, the urge to commit a suicide bombing. We will look at that with the familiarity that we understand troop movements and bombers and peace treaties. That will give us ownership and context. And context is what we need. And context is what we don't have. So all we get is fear. Bottomless issues. Prove the negative. I can't be afraid. And even if you're not afraid, I'm going to make you afraid. And if you're afraid, I'm going to make you more afraid. And if you're afraid, I own you. I own you. You know, I wrote in the 90s about race in America. What happened to race? Gone. When was the last time we talked about education, really? Pew, gone. All of those issues eclipsed by the power of fear. And the only thing that burns off fear, the only thing, is knowledge. That means people, us, we, have to say, I'm not going to look away. I'm going to look right at it. And I'm not only going to look right at it, I'm going to take ownership of it. And once I do, I'll know the right questions to ask. And I'll know that doesn't mean anything, and that does. And here are solutions. And then we get the government we deserve, those people that work for us. That's the way it ends up working. And then when someone throws out this angry, wild, over-the-top, you know, lexicon that we're in some kind of civilizational struggle with a bunch of guys in a cave in Afghanistan, we're going, stop it. Let me just finish with this. Two seconds. We will survive this. We will ultimately build muscles, strength by virtue of context, by virtue of going about our quotidian, pedestrian, day-to-day -day lives and saying, I'm still standing, and saying, no, no, I will not give in to fear. I will not give in to hate. I will not get in to give in to narrowing them down to some sort of evil quotient. We're coming out of it now a little bit. It's a few years since 9-11. The problem with 9-11 is that anything you do in reaction to 9-11, essentially, that has to be justified somehow, will be force. Everything else is what well, leaves you open to virulent attack. We're getting past it now. It's taken a while. And I'll tell you, part of what's saving us right now, you're talking about John Mueller, the guy says there's no real threat. Part of what's saving us is what I, <laughs> it's what I call the, uh, the producer's effect. <laughs> the fact is, is that they still do check the jihadists of the world at the last minute in with the bosses. They're operational, they say, is now the time. And up to now, we understand that they've said no. Don't move. Why? Because our enemy here is savvy and strategic. And what do they say? <laughs> America's doing our work for us. Why would we want to attack them again? Build sympathy for them. The object of any foreign policy, any country, unite your allies, divide your enemies. <laughs> We've done the opposite on both scores. 
from that one attack. Why would you ever, if you were our opponents, want to attack us again? Not now. They will at a time of their choosing. Everyone in intelligence agrees on that. So ultimately, it's our screw-ups that are probably saving us from the next damn attack. <laughs> That's why I call it the producer's index. Gene Wilder, Zero Mostel. <laughs> Failure can save you. That's what's doing it. The fact is, is that what history shows again and again is that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. This is not just Martin Luther King saying this. It's also Theodore Parker, the progressive abolitionist in the 19th century. One white, one black, they're kindred. They stand on shoulders. Parker's on people's shoulders. King's on Parker's shoulders. Both of them caught in a dizzying social movement of ferocity, of anger, of irrationality. And King, early on, says, look, some of us up ahead will be killed. We will be reviled, we'll be hated, we'll be spat upon, and we'll be killed. He says this in the early 60s. But he says, be not deterred. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I have no doubt that it will bend towards justice precisely because tonight we have a lot of people here in this full horrible rain. So thank you for coming.